How you doing today? Uh, I'm James Eichinger. This is Changing Data Indifference to Data Curiosity at the University of Rochester. Uh, I want to start off with a quote from Thomas Davenport. Uh, he goes to talk about a discussion he had. I was talking to a fellow who heads a decision engineering group at a big computer company, and he said, in all my years here, no executive has ever come to me or my group and said, help us make better decisions. He said, occasionally, they'll come to him and say we need to make faster decisions. And while he does that, he can often help them make better decisions. But he said more often, people will say, help us justify this decision that we want to make. Does that sound familiar to you folks? <laughs> yeah, uh, it's, a, it's a culture change. And uh, well, it's something we're all familiar with. How many folks are here from uh, education higher ed? OK. Uh, any sales groups, things like that? Anybody specifically in fundraising? OK, great. And it's interesting because for those of you that aren't in fundraising, uh, we very much believe that we have a sales force. Instead of, instead of widgets, we're selling good feelings, uh, which is a tough thing to sell. Uh, <clears throat> so I work at the University of Rochester's Alumni and Advancement Center. Uh, I'm the assistant director of prospect analysis. I have cards that are back on the water cooler there. You can get them when you leave. Uh, quick about University of Rochester. Uh, we're a private research university. Uh, we've got students and faculty, full-time undergraduates, uh, 5,300. Uh, full-time graduate students, 3,200. Uh, Part-time grad students, about 1,000. Uh, globally, we've got 100,000 alumni. Uh, we've got a bunch of schools, arts, sciences, engineering, uh, the Eastman School of Music. Uh, everybody here see the Super Bowl last year? We're in Seattle. Uh, Renee Fleming, she sang the Star Spangled Banner. That's how a University of Rochester alumna sings the national anthem. <laughs> Did a great job. Proud of that. Uh, we also have uh, the School of Medicine and Dentistry, which you cannot get a degree in dentistry from. I'm still trying to figure that one out. Uh, it needs some rebranding. Uh, School of Nursing, the Simon Graduate School of Business, and the Warner Graduate School of Education. We also have the University of Rochester Medical Center, which uh, has research in neurology, uh, cancer, a uh, variety of things. So part of my job is to support the fundraising efforts for all those distinct programs. Uh, right now, we're coming in the very end of a comprehensive capital campaign. It's our first. The goal is to uh, raise $1.2 billion by uh, December 31st, 2016. Uh, with less than two years left, it looks like we're going to hit our goal. Um, when I had to go and do this presentation for Tableau over WebEx, they actually said I had to talk about myself a little bit more. So I'm, I'm glad you're all sitting. This is going to take a while. Uh, really, honestly, my path here is not special at all. As a matter of fact, it's kind of a comedy of errors. Uh, I went to school at a New York State school for three years for political science until they decided I should leave because I was having too much fun. Uh, I floated around, and I ended up working at the U of R's Laboratory for Laser Energetics. Uh, laser science, sure, why not, without a degree. While I was there, I had the good fortune of getting my bachelor's and my master's from U of R. Uh, and one of the things that I really kind of noticed when I was working at the laser lab, uh, if you're a fan of, uh, um, oh, what's the show? The, with Sheldon, I'm sorry, I'm Big blanking. Bang Big Bang Theory. Well, you get an idea of some of the folks that I worked with. So I was a technician, and technicians are generally uh, former military. Uh, they have associate's degrees. So that's one group speaking their own language. You've got engineers, and then you've got scientists. And not only do you have scientists, but you've got the theorists who are like, whoa. And then you've got the experimentalists who are a little bit more grounded. Software developers. Everybody there was speaking geek, but they all had their different dialects. Uh, I kind of carved out a role for myself there because I could speak a variety of different dialects of geek. So that was a huge thing that I took away from that. And a lot of that uh, applies to where I am now because I've got to be able to talk about technical terms, uh, statistics, and analysis with fundraisers. And they are people persons, not data people. So being able to communicate is a huge plus. Today, we're going to talk about changing, uh, 
changing the culture, how you can move through stages of growth of an analytical culture, catalyst for that change. And then we're going to take a look at some things that happened at U of R that helped us go from uh, a very non-analytical culture to something that uh, hopefully is moving in the right direction. So I think everybody here has heard the term democratization of data, right? So analytics is springing up wherever there's data, and there's data everywhere. Um, my sister-in-law, we went to Disney World, our families. She got the seasonal wait times for all the Disney World rides, brought it into Excel, and she figured out this entire itinerary of what rides we're going to hit when, which ones needed to be fast passed, which ones we just can't do because we're not going to have time. And believe it or not, it was actually a really fun vacation, but there were points where I felt like I was uh, in second grade on a field trip. <laughs> Had to buddy up. Um, so and, uh, our interactions with data are fundamentally different. <clears throat> and one of the first places that I think this kind of started, uh, I go to the US Today, USA Today infographic. You know, you, that silly little graphic that's more fluff than information that says, uh, the monthly average of cans of pop, or soda, sorry, I'm from western New York, uh, monthly average cans of soda that people drink every year, and they've got the cans stacked up on top of each other. I mean, I'm sure Stephen Few's head explodes every time one of those is printed, and the fact that I'm actually talking about it right now, he's probably got a headache. But still, they, they get people to think about data in a way that they wouldn't if it was just in a regular table. Speaking of tables, Excel. Excel's done a good job catching up. Uh, I'm not working with it, but the most recent version of Excel has slicers, which are very much like quick filters. Uh, think of that. Something that is not quite as good as Tableau, of course, but has some of the functionality on every PC, every laptop, and every house. And then, of course, interactive dashboards. Now, the proliferation of data sets is also huge. You can get data on anything that you want. Data.gov, is anybody, are you, are you all familiar with data.gov? Fantastic stuff. You actually have to slice and dice it, uh, get it in a manageable, manageable way. But uh, great stuff there. Not only that, but then you can go to vendors and get all sorts of data. Uh, business culture is adapted to different rates. The nonprofit world generally lags 10 years behind the for-profit sector. So that's kind of where I'm at. And then there's Tom Davenport, who I'm a big fan of. He's, read, he's written two books. I think he's got a third coming out. Uh, Competing on Analytics, The New Science of Winning, and Analytics at Work, Smarter Decisions, Better Results. Uh, anybody here, are you familiar with Tom Davenport? Never heard of him? Good, Good stuff. And actually, I'm going to steal liberally from him. But first, uh, before I do that, going right back to Michael Lewis. Uh, I love this quote. People operate with beliefs and biases. To the extent you can eliminate both and replace them with data, you gain a clear advantage. I don't have to go and recap Moneyball. Uh, I think Michael Lewis actually did a very good job recapping it for us. Um, but I love Moneyball because the story of the scouts, the, the clash of the culture, very much exists at the very least where I work with fundraisers that have been raising money forever. They know what they're doing. Uh, and now, they're, they need to adapt to be a little bit smarter and make decisions with data. So <clears throat> our major gift donors, uh, they cultivate gifts of $50,000 or more. Uh, and it's very similar to the scouts and the reactions to the changing world. Um, the lessons from Moneyball help us at U of R kind of make a difference in the way they do things. So. One of the things that they did in Moneyball is they reframed the problem to address an outcome. They decided it's not about the players. It's about wins. So they wanted to go and look for players that their skills specifically addressed offensive output. They didn't care about defense. Their idea was the problem is we need to get on base. If we're getting on base, we're not creating outs. If we're not creating outs, the other team isn't getting up to bat, and they're not scoring. Instead of looking at players, they said, this is what we need to do and evolve the strategy to fit that outcome. Uh, putting time in to understand the big picture. Uh, <laughs> according to Davenport, data scientists can be plugged in anywhere on the org chart. And that's great power. 
And just like Uncle Ben told Spider-Man, with great power comes great responsibility. Uh, we really we pride ourselves on being data curious, extending that curiosity to our organization, being curious about what is happening in our organization, why, uh, helps us enrich our analysis, and uh, it promotes our goal to integrate the anal that analysis with the overall strategy of the organization. Um, <clears throat> base hits. You might want to swing for the fences. You might want to go out and have a massive impact with your analysis, uh, blow the top off of things. That's high risk, high reward. Um, it is a better strategy that I've found is to get on base, just like the Oakland A's. Base hits, be consistent, small projects that eventually start to add up to bigger and better things. Uh, I'll tell you about some of my base hits and home runs in a bit. Um, also, show them, don't tell them. Present your findings and their impact. Yeah, no duh, right? But it's actually about establishing trust and confidence. I've found that when I'm telling managers, the chief advan advancement officer things, I need to be able to back that up on the spot so it makes sense to them. Um, also, bad data, faulty analysis, that happens. You've got to own it. It'll take a hit to your, uh, your trust level, your confidence. But in a lot of ways, you're like a football player. They don't want to get hit. They're going to get hit, though. Uh, sometimes you need to be prepared to take, to take those hits and understand how you're going to recover from them uh, and improve your analysis. So this is Davenport's five stages of analytical, analytical competency. This is their 50,000 foot view that executives think of. Uh, stage one, analytically impl impaired. That's so harsh, isn't it? Like, you're analytically impaired. Gee, thanks. Yeah, this is, Davenport says, this is an organization that has uh, the lacks the skill or interest to compete on analytics. I don't think anyone here, just by being here, your organization probably isn't in that. But you could be. I don't know. I'm not really too sure uh, once you open up Excel, you're already moving out of that. Localized analytics, that's where uh, activities are uncoordinated and they remain separate from each other. So silo analytics, uh, sometimes using their own databases. So in that case, single versions of the truth are, are out of the picture. Uh, everybody's kind of doing their own thing and sometimes you're doing it with their own data. Analytical aspirations, stage three. This is where intent exists. It's got some slow progress behind it. This is like the show me stage. This is where an organization might say, we need to be more analytical. We need to go and start moving in this direction. But they're still going with their gut. And sometimes they check on, in with the analysts. Sometimes they're looking at the analysts to get them to say, we're going to make this decision. Tell us it's the right thing to do. And then four and five, widespread use of analytics internal, internally with coordination. And then five is uh, being a competitor with your analytics. Procter & Gamble. Uh, progressive is in that zone. So this is great. This is great from an MBA standpoint, but if you're looking to diagnose where you're at, uh, this chart from Davenport I found is actually a little bit more descriptive. This is the front lines view. So you've got the degree, you've got different degrees of reporting and analysis. And one of the things I love about this is your, the line of demarcation right there in between reports and analytics, because and it's worth, it really should be on a t-shirt. Reporting is not analytics. Uh, and that is one of the first things that, if you're trying to change your culture, that'll be the first battle you have. Uh, getting a list of names, aggregate numbers on a sheet of paper, and having people look at it, that's not analytics. It's just reports. So at U of R, we've moved uh, through using Tableau, we've moved through all the uh, reporting regimes and into analytics. Standard reports, ad hoc reports, that's where I entered the, entered the picture. Uh, as you get smarter and better, you can move up. Here's the thing. Just because you offer these does not mean 
you're in those regimes. You've got to have consumers that are actually using it. We've had predictive modeling since 2010, and it really hasn't been used until, I'd say, about 18 months ago. Uh, so, you know, it, it was on the shelf collecting dust, and nobody was really utilizing it. We tried, and now we're, we're moving in a, in a direction where that's getting. So, catalysts of change. The main thing that will change the culture is a crisis. And that's great until the crisis is over. What do you think happens after that? Yeah. You go right back to what you were doing before until the next crisis. So not a lasting way to change things. Leadership change is good. Uh, Oakland A's. Yeah, Billy Bean was the right person in the right place at the right time that was able to make that type of uh, transit, uh, transformative change for the organization and also baseball. Now, what I'm doing at U of R is the Skunk Works. Has anybody heard Skunk, work, skunk Works familiar with the term? At Lockheed Martin, their advanced development program, they nicknamed it Skunk Works. That's like a small group of engineers uh, who were working with very little oversight, uh, very little budget constraints to just chase after interesting projects. And the stuff that came out of Skunk Works for Lockheed Martin is like the SR-71 Blackbird a lot of the stealth technology for planes. All came out 50s and 60s from Skunk Works. What we're doing is you know, going back to the Davenport where you've got the silos of analysts. I'm trying to round them up and create that into Skunk Works. So at the very least, we're sharing what we're doing. We're trying to improve each other and get things more and more centralized. Uh, initial projects. Uh, who, who here has not done data cleanup for their first Tableau project? I'm really curious. It's always, you know, I'm going to go, this is going to be great, I'm going to help the fundraisers, and oh my gosh, what's with all the null fields? Uh, data cleanup is always the first thing, and Tableau is like a flashlight, and bad data are roaches, and you just find bad data using Tableau. It's fantastic. Uh, once you're done with that, you can really do two different things. You can figure some project that's going to impact your efficiency, you know, make a splash, uh, make friends. It's always a good one to start with. One of my favorite other projects to do will not make you friends. That's myth busting. Going against the grain. Uh, man, I'm telling you. We have, uh, we've got a sizable donor pool in New York City. Uh, it's our second biggest area. And Westchester County, for some reason, they think it's a bottomless pit of affluent donors. And we're going to get another fundraiser. We're going to assign them to Westchester. And I went through, I'm like, I'm, I'm telling you, there is nobody left in Westchester. Stop sending people there. No, Westchester. And it was a huge mess. We hired somebody, deployed them, and there was absolutely no one for them to go visit. Uh, but yeah, that myth busting, they, they listen to me a little bit more now when I'm myth-busting, just to tell them it's not, just don't do that. Tools and resources. Now, of course, you've got Tableau. Great tool. But utilizing Tableau as, uh, to create graphics to use in presentations, uh, for a qualitative analysis, to refer, to, uh, refer back to uh, charts in memos, things like that, use it almost like a, as a media generator. Uh, get out of the desktop and actually put something in somebody's hand that they can go and pass off to somebody else. Uh, I'm going to show you uh, an example of a memo in a little bit. So, the case study. When I started up at U of R, it was 2009. We were still in the quiet phase of the campaign, and that, that basically means when, when you're going to raise a lot of money, you don't tell anybody about it and you raise like half or three quarters of the money, and then when you're pretty much locked, then you say, hey, we're going to raise a lot of money. It's, that way you don't have egg on your face. So we're still in the quiet phase of the campaign. Um, we had two years, uh, it's been two years since we deployed our CRM, which is, uh, so many people have bought this. Uh, I think Lucian owns Advance right now, so we use Advance, uh, and we had Cognos for reporting. Uh, problem? Cognos was really, really tedious to do reporting with. So it would take a week or two for the reporting team to be able to generate a report. 
fundraisers, and I love them to death, they do something I cannot do, uh, most specifically remember a name. Uh, but they are not exactly what you would say, in, if you go by uh, Covey's habits, they are not in the, the second quadrant, the proactive. They're very much, I'm going on a trip, I need a list tomorrow. Cognos was not really able to suit their purposes for that. Uh, so that meant that I was in the ad hoc reporting business. Uh, and I would go in with Toad, I'd make a query, pull it out, format it in Excel, hand it over to them. So the whole thing was just uh, not ideal and not optimal. Uh, and it was always about lists. They always wanted a list of names. Uh, list, lists, lists. And if there's ever, if you ever, ever sit down with a fundraiser and they have a list of names, people they know, you won't get more than five names down that list before you've, you're launched into like a five minute story about one of the people on that list. It's actually one of the more painful things about my job. Uh, Great stories, but you know, you've got 30 minutes to go through 100 names and you're stopping every five for a story. It's pretty painful. Uh, so we actually looked at Tableau not for data visualization. We looked at it, uh, and you know, it's embarrassing to admit this, we looked at it as an ad hoc reporting tool to go and be able to have something that is set up. We could pull reports out and send them out as an alternative to Cognos. Um, so while we were on the trial version for desktop, and we've we started on version four. So we've been using Tableau like forever and ever. Um, my office, the Office of Prospect Management, we were asked to do a presentation of the donor pool in New York City for the chief advancement officer. We decide, you know, crazy as we were, that we were actually going to go use Tableau, have some visualiz visualizations set up, and work through them with the chief advance advancement officer. Not to, not to use PowerPoint, just go with the data and slice and dice. So this is a, a screenshot of one of the visualizations we used. This is like naked baby pictures for me. Um, it, I'm, it, my stuff is much better than this, and I'll show it to you, but I, I want you to get an idea of where I was. Uh, this was built in four, but it upgraded to eight when I made the screenshot, so uh, it, it was actually, an eight actually probably made it look better than it was. So. Um, we presented using the desktop. I had a couple filters set up. Um, I, wasn't using, I wasn't using the dashboards either, so this was shrinking and getting, uh, the sizing was all wrong because I was on a, a monitor that was only outputting at 720. So it, it was just a mess and it wasn't very good. Um, but you know, the presentation was okay. There was head scratching, uh, some frustration just because of, not because of my stuff, but because we couldn't really get our hands around what was happening in New York City. Um, it was interesting, but there wasn't a clear outcome. Uh, but then, I put up a map. Uh, the first lean-in moment. And I'll tell you what, this instantly changed the whole tenor in the room. Uh, I, was, I was unprepared for the kind of impact that a map with data would have. Um, I had drilled down uh, moments, uh, the whole thing, the, the view underlying data function, which is absolutely terrible in order to show people what that data underneath looks like. They didn't care. They were happy with what they were getting, uh, happy to get the drill down. Um, I actually would drop out of the presentation mode and make changes uh, on the fly, put it back up. Uh, there was a lot of great interaction, all because of maps. Uh, at the end of the meeting, the chief advancement officer uh, confirmed with us. He said, this is a trial, right? You're still on the trial for this? I said, yeah. He's like, you buy it. So right there, it was, uh, it was when we fell in love. It was great. So we were able to put out, and this is how I kind of defeat that whole uh, drill, the view underlying data. Uh, I make a cross tab, and they interact with it. So decision makers were able to ask questions, get data. Uh, get answers from the data and be able to go through and start to do some slicing and dicing. Um, and it, this really helped us start to move towards a single version of the truth, uh, which we hadn't had before. Bless you. So regional analytics was our jam. That's, that was what our hook was. I suggest you 
look at your own organization, find out what you're going to make a name for yourself doing. We do other projects analytically, but we carved out, we carved out our corner of the store on doing regional analytics. Uh, leading with maps, uh, drill down, along for filtering. The problem was is that uh, our development sophistication quickly outpaced the sophistication of our users. So there's still like this restraining order on me that I'm not allowed to show a Gantt or a Box and Whisker chart to anyone. <laughs> yeah, that was not a good decision on my part. And if I could go back in time, that would be one of the ones I'd fix. Uh, we're still in the land of lists, uh, but instead of them creating their lists, uh, a thousand names, and just doing sorts and filtering, uh, they're starting to work in other data elements using Tableau and create a smarter list. Uh, but there were still ad hoc tendencies. Everything uh, was very, what? Uh, they needed it special, special jobs. So let me, I think this is a good time. Why don't I actually show you some, some stuff? So this is one of our first, we got server. And what I wanted to do, I don't know if this is actually picking me up at all. We got server. And I wanted to give fundraisers a way to go through and to interact with the donor pool. So really what happens is you're assigned to Buffalo. Buffalo, who the Buffalo Bills now have a new owner, and they're not moving out of Buffalo, so I use Buffalo. They're going to go make a visit uh, for a week, spend time in Buffalo. They're going to need to find people that will actually uh, potentially meet with them and discuss about major gifts. So I threw this together. And I actually didn't throw it together. It worked really hard on it, but it's still trash. It is trash. A um, couple things that I did wrong here. I'll start with my design problems. First of all, um, you can kind of see. I look at this in the, that, no, that's not what I wanted to do. So it's not, the dashboard is not sized. So this is going to change its shape depending on the monitor that people use. And some fundraisers are operating their monitors at 800 by 600. I didn't even know that. This looks absolutely horrible on that. When you see my next dashboards, I'm actually sizing for iPad landscape now. Everything that I develop, and it took me a while to get used to limiting the amount of real estate that I'm able to use, but that's made a huge difference just in terms of consistency of appearance. Um, the charts, uh, there's no, no uh, column lines, and all the colors are opaque. It's not pretty. It's just not pretty. Back in the version, I think this was made using version 5, they didn't have uh, shapes for zip codes, so all these bubbles are zip codes, and you got a mouse over. It's not very pretty. It looks like somebody's got the measles. Uh, everything's sortable, and I did do some nice stuff here. I've got, we have two different predictive models. One is a major gift model, and the other one is uh, our annual fund model. And this is actually a parameter, and by choosing that, it goes and it changes uh, what it's referring to. And so you can go through. If you want to find the top 5%, In the model in Buffalo, there you go. Everything changes. There's your list. We've got some quick filters over here. And, you know, I thought it was good. Well, how do you use it? How would you use it? Well, I don't know. There's no workflow, right? Are you supposed to start with a map? Well, maybe. Do that. But, you know, you're not telling a story here. And if you're a fundraiser, sales force, somebody that's not analytically inclined, you might look at this and just say, you know what, it's easier for me to sort in Excel and walk away from it. Or just go and export the whole list and then work with it in Excel. So one thing that I decided, I wanted to be able to give people an experience like they're installing software. So you know, you don't go and drop drop things in the directories that they need to go in, right? It opens up a wizard. Do you want to install this? Yes. Do you want to install the Jeeves toolbar? No. <laughs> you go right through. 
you have an experience. And then you end up with an output. So, and I really hope that story points would do this. Um, and I, I think that it probably will. It's not there yet, though. Um, so what I use, uh, I use actions to advance uh, through to get, ultimately, to get the fundraisers to a list. <clears throat> Any questions so far before, well, this is loading? Anybody have anything? OK, great. Oh, I'm sorry? Uh, it's actually, I've built a data mart that deals with prospect data um, and also summarizes some of the giving information because the, the from Elucian, from Advance, the data mart does. I can query those tables as well, but I've got data prepped and then I, I do an extract every morning at 7 a.m. Uh, and then that goes for the day and then it. So, I've jumbled this up. The numbers don't really aren't indicative. We have more than we have more than 2,000 alumni in Rochester. So this is page one, and a couple things. First of all, do you need to know how to use it? Well, just mouse over, mouse over the question mark, and you get a pop up that has directions. Uh, that's a trick I picked up in the San Diego customer conference two years ago. I love that. Um, so what do we got? We can do anything here now. Uh, start with the map, clearly. Another great thing about this, remember how I said that I was getting a lot of ad hoc requests and I'd have to consistently change things? Well, before, you were looking at Buffalo, and only Buffalo. Um, and you didn't get any sort of aggregates, right? It just was a list of names. Well, now, you're looking at everybody in the continental United States, and you've got aggregates. So if you're just concerned with your total number of alumni, you can get it here. Uh, if you need to know how many current parents we have in Washington, it's right there. You don't even have to go through. You've got summary aggregates right there. So this is kind of one-stop shopping. Uh, this map is actually a dual-axis map. Uh, I use core-based statistical areas uh, to, as, as a region for people. Uh, but some folks don't live in a CVSA. Uh, we have a sizable, I think Vermont is actually the one state where we've got people that just are outside of CBSAs. Uh, so the map is mapping on CBSA, and where there is not a CBSA, it maps by county. So you get some counties in there too, and that captures pretty much everybody. Um, God, and when they, when they made the apply button here, I really wanted to fly right to Seattle and kiss somebody. Um, <laughs> Because I would actually, I would have to train people. I'd be like, okay, now once you start clicking, you've got to click fast. Like, and then, and really, they'd be, and they were up for the challenge, too. It was almost like a game, like, click, 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 click. Oh, it's refreshing. Oh, I got to do. All right, I'll wait, I'll wait. Click, 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 click. I felt like such a dork. They're like, can't you make it different? Like, I don't actually write this stuff. I'm, um, so everything here, you know, you can interact with this. And once you decide what you need to do, and let's just go and, uh, we'll, we'll pick on our folks up here. So let's say that I'm interested in Seattle and I'm also interested in Portland. So you can go through and select, and I'm holding control right now because I'm going to select both. I have no idea why that's taking so long. So selecting both, boom you've got them down there. Now, if you're ready to move on, you can lock in locations. And that's that action I was talking about. I wish I could make this a button. Uh, and for whatever reason, I've not been able to do it. If any of you are smart enough, let me know. I will buy you a beer. So now, it takes you to the next page, the, the whole wizard mentality. And I really honestly don't know why this is taking so long. It's much faster. It's the disaster of demoing. So now we've got zip code maps. Instead of it being a, a pimply map like before, you've actually got some spots. And the reason this is important is sometimes gift officers will travel to an area because they're already going to be seeing somebody there. They've got 
Uh, Wally West of the Wally West Foundation is going to be making uh, a sizable gift for the track team. While they're in Seattle, they want to see somebody that might live around Wally West. So they can go through and zoom in, and then they can pick the zip codes that surround where Wally West lives and not have to look at everything. So again, it's kind of getting them out of the Excel mindset and being able to slice and dice the data and work interactively with it. <clears throat> Up above, you get some summary aggregates of when the last time we contacted these folks and when the last time we actually had a face-to-face -face visit with them. Uh, also, you've got the city counts down here. Uh, this is actually useful because you can click on it and it highlights all the zip codes that make up Portland, Oregon, and same as Seattle. So you can select your cities this way, or you can do it that way. Or they can just, you know, just blow through this one. Uh, I don't have an advanced button built. I think once they got the idea, so I've never been asked for it. So still, we're moving towards a list, but we're not quite there. And this is where I hit them with the analytics hammer. Uh, this is where I've moved them through maps. They're comfortable. I'm, I'm, they're in their comfort zone. They're happy place. They're ready to see some bar charts. Uh, yeah, not going to hit them with a Gantt chart, that's for sure. So a couple things. Now, I was bagging on myself before. These are uh, translucent now. Um, I go to 70% translucency. Uh, I've got some lines here taking up that space, so it's not all white space. Um, what, I, what, I, what am I showing them here? I've got some counts so they can get, know what the total number that they're working with. I repeat some quick filters, some quick filters that were on the front page. Originally, I had them on the front page, and I was actually sending them back to the front page. If they got here, and oh wait, you know, I, I just, I want to look just at prospects. Go back to the front. No. I just duplicated it, threw them right here. Um, you've got your question mark for directions. I'm holding hands here, and I'm also tantalizing them with this button. I did get this to work. This, is, this creates the list. <clears throat> Something also that I'm, I'm starting to be uh, a stickler for is, and I, I haven't built it in this. I thought I did. Uh, tool tips. Cleaning up your tool tips. Um, and I really need to do that. Uh, the standard out-of-the-box tool tip pop-ups are kind of ugly. Um, going through and changing formatting, things like that, editing them. I think that actually the last one I've got, I've, I've done something neat, and I'll show you that. Um, but that's also very useful. Another thing, if you look at these tool tips, and I wish, I wish that those would stay up there for a specific time. This is RFM. Are you familiar with RFM, recency, frequency, magnitude? It's uh, where we've got predictive models. This is a descriptive model. So it puts out a score for how recently you get a certain amount of points for how recently you've given, how frequently you've given, and how much you've given. Um, in order to make it a little less obtuse, when you mouse over, you actually get a description of the people that fall in there. So what does it mean to be in the top 5% of the RFM score? Well, that means that you've given five years. The median person's given five out of the last five years, $1,800 in the last five years, 3,400 to the campaign, 57 lifetime. So it's kind of demystifying what's going on behind the numbers. Uh, fundraisers can reach out and understand that. So yeah, uh, this slice and dice, what you care about, top 10% of donors. And we get that. And we can even go and pick up, wait, wait, wait. GC model, mix in some predictive modeling, everything changes, all is well, and now we're going to go to a list. For the life of me, I don't know why that's taking so long. Okay, great. <laughs> <sighs> anyway, moving right along, and so there's 300,000 names in the database, and if they just went to the last page, 
Tableau server would crash. And the guy that handles it on the tech end, he's bigger than me, and he'd knock me out. Um, so I actually had to build that, that it only populates once that button is pressed so nobody goes to the last page and creates a list of 300,000 names. Uh, what I was talking about with the tooltip before, you can go through and change it so the red and the blue and the black here, that's all data, and then the text are right around it. So just to make it look pretty. So this is one of the things that I've rolled out, and it's actually met a lot of people's needs. Uh, it's kind of a utilitarian, right? Uh, you can use it to get information on the donor pool. Uh, you can help uh, get local information, a variety of different things. Uh, any questions on that, that visualization? I've actually got uh, another one that I put together in a similar vein that allows, yeah? Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt your question. No, it's all right. <laughs> The very last step, they export it, and they, they really, they honestly, they send it to the scheduling office in order to start calling. They might go through it in it to, Excel. to Excel. Yeah, they still have to go to Excel, but uh, it's not. Is there a button for that, or do they type it through? There is a, on server, there's the export button uh, at the top, and they export it to cross tab, and away they go. No problem. Anything, any other questions? So the initial stages when we're doing all the presenta uh, presenting, taking us back to 2010, uh, I was doing ad hoc presentations. And this is before server came in. So now, instead of them getting ad hoc reports, I'm doing presentations every three weeks, which is OK, because you know, I can use the work. But uh, there was a better way to do things. The other thing. After you do a Tableau presentation, people have some great thoughts, there's insights, but they walk away from it and they go on to the next thing. So you're kind of missing that lightning in a bottle that happens when you're doing data discovery with a large group. There's nothing that, unless somebody took really good notes, you're walking away empty handed. Um, a Tableau was still being seen as an a alternate report generator. So, yeah, and also I, I have to throw XKCD in my presentations, so that's a nice one. Because honestly, this became more of a marketing issue then, is how do we continue this? When I'm not in the room working with them using Tableau, how am I making sure that the managers are still using data? So a couple things. You've got to remember you're competing for the attention of decision makers. So you're going you're gonna to have to look for different uh, avenues of getting your your word out. Uh, you really have to be an, a, an evangelist for your analysis. So creating a memo uh, and getting people used to getting a memo, uh, have an executive summary for it. Uh, when you do a slide deck presentation with, uh, with PowerPoint, throw notes, use the notes function. Uh, you know, you, you can go through and look at your bullet points, but the text that accompanies those completely lost. Uh, and having some filling out the notes uh, really helps carry that on. Uh, podcasts. We actually did for about a year, we were doing uh, a podcast that would summarize what was going on uh, for solicitations every month and the major gifts that were booked. Uh, my supervisor at the time, she and I would sit down and we'd try to do like a goofy little uh, freakalytics type uh, campy podcast that would just walk through the important information for managers so they could get a summary of it. The point of that is everybody consumes information differently. And so some people are going to want it written down. Some people are going to need to hear it, see it. Uh, I haven't met anybody that t wants to taste it yet, but if I do, I'll, I'll let you know. Um, also, have a clinic, office hours. That's been really good because it allows people that, your gift officers, your sales force, to be able to stop in at their leisure uh, 
and sometimes it actually lets them, uh, it, it takes the pressure off. Uh, if they're coming to you and asking for help with their portfolio instead of it being some sort of fire you need to put out. So every two weeks, I have, uh, I have a conference room, a couple laptops. I sit down in there for an hour and a half. Uh, an email goes out that you know, the doctor is in, I'm like Lucy. Uh, no, no Peanuts fans, huh? Not even a shackle. Uh, and people wander in and wander out. And I help them with Tableau. I help them using uh, the CRM advance, uh, all sorts of things. So it's beneficial. It puts a face on what you're doing, too. Uh, if they're just getting emails from you, sometimes it's good that you know, you're sitting down and, and talking to them. Screen ca capture, your visualizations, they really help you anchor your points. Uh, stick with bar charts and histograms. Don't get super wicked flashy. Uh, dual axis charts, scatter plots are useful. Uh, I actually, there was a conversation uh, the first time I did a dual axis chart and put it in our monthly memo. Uh, there was a conversation of, whoa, you know, are, are we sure that they're going to be able to handle a dual axis chart? I'm like, I, I think it's time to push them out of their comfort zone. Yeah, <laughs> we got to do it. Uh, lead with a map. Uh, maps provi provide a great frame of reference. Uh, people gravitate to them. Uh, even if the map is tangential to the overall story you're telling, sometimes it's good just to lead with it and then move away from it. Uh, and also polish up your graphics. You know, remove the underscores from the words, uh, the metadata, clean all of it up, uh, make it look pretty. So the monthly memo, uh, it, fo it focuses on uh, the management on gift officer performance. One of the problems that we have is we live in a culture that is very concerned with credit, gift credit. So how many solicitations have you made? How many gifts have you booked? The problem there is we have a wide variety of different things that people can solicit for. Very often, you might have a gift that is in support of the Golisano Children's Hospital, as well as the Simon School of Business. So you've got two gift officers that are working on that solicitation. They both get credit for it. When you're living in a world of credit, one $1 million gift that two people worked on does not mean it is two gifts for a total of $2 million. It's been a challenge in order to say, no, everybody's meeting their goals, but because there's so much collaboration, our overall goal is we're lagging behind. It's been a huge problem. Not a huge problem, but it's been a huge problem to get that point across. Uh, the monthly memo has helped uh, focus on that. Uh, it also explores other things that pop up uh, over time. Uh, very often, the, the, an the analysis we do in the monthly memo is tip of the spear. So I'm bringing up things that are likely to uh, really kind of come to the surface and be a problem a few months in the future. So not everybody reads it, but the people that do read it uh, are ahead of the curve on, trend, on changing trends. Uh, keep it short and try to send it out. Try to send it out at the same time. Here's a, this isn't actually the monthly memo. This is a regional analysis that I did um, for gift officer deployment. But the memo is very similar. Uh, the things that I do with this, really, it's repetition. Anything worth saying is, anything important is worth saying more than once. I'm going to say that again. No, I'm kidding. Uh, really, honestly, everything here is repeated multiple times. So you've got the bullets, you've got the graphic, you've got the, the caption underneath. All three things say the same thing, and I repeat it. Uh, they're all reinforcing each other. So, and you know, you could clean it up, make it look pretty, use different colors, and you know, it doesn't look that bad. So, starting to wrap up. Uh, since 2010, the analytical landscape's changed at advancement. Um, a lot of the decisions we make are based on analytics, or at the very least, they're referenced by analytics, uh, which is good. I mean, we're in the conversation. We uh, recently had uh, two major projects that we spearheaded through analytics. And one of them was uh, fundraiser portfolio downsizing. Uh, it's like in Jerry Maguire. Jerry Maguire said that 
you know, what we need to do is we need to have less clients, right? Have better relationships with them. That fundamentally is the same thing that we did with our gift officers. We tailored them down from 150 prospects in their portfolio. We wanted to get that down to a more manageable number, in some cases uh, 80, even lower if they've got managerial uh, duties. We were able to do that, convince uh, the administration, because we had the data to say, look, we've got these portfolios of this size, and people aren't being seen, people aren't being solicited, uh, there's no activity. And because of that, the people that they should be seeing are getting lost. Uh, it was a huge coup, uh, and it was all because of Tableau, and it was all because of uh, the changing in the, uh, in the organization's cu culture. Uh, descriptive and predictive models are also starting to pick up speed. Uh, just by being referenced and being in the visualization, more people are becoming familiar with it and not being afraid of it. Uh, I had somebody... I had somebody say, for whatever reason, they saw the actual model. And so they saw a coefficient for volunteering. And for whatever, whatever it was, it was two. And they said, our volunteers are twice as likely to give a gift. I'm like, no, 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 that's not true. You don't understand what you're talking about. Yeah, that was, that was uh, a joke that refused to die for a while. Um, silo analytics are beginning to shut down. Uh, the silo databases are a thing of the past. Uh, we're able to show visually and through the memo, uh, a lot of those silo databases uh, have bad data in them. They're counting solicitations that happened in the past. They're counting them in the current year. Uh, they're not accurate. Uh, and because we're, we are moving towards a single version of the truth, we've got more people on our side than uh, on, on the evil side. We're looking at talent analytics. So this is, uh, this is like in baseball again. There's the war score, right? Uh, wins above replacement. Uh, and something that we're beginning to look at is can we actually go th and look at, our, look at our fundraisers and evaluate them in terms of if they were to leave, what would happen to the, re what kind of change in activity would the replacement bring to the table? So those that are really above the average, if you make the war score right, really above average, you want to be able to retain them, and you could also go and see the people that might not be uh, worth keeping. Uh, that's a fun project. And then there's uh, social networking data, which none of the vendors here are doing and Tableau isn't doing, but uh, there's a tool called Node Excel uh, that maps social networking data. Uh, LinkedIn has something that's very similar. When they go through and it maps out your, your LinkedIn professional network, have any, any of you use that? Um, Node Excel uses Excel. It's an add-on for it, which could go through and you can map out who knows who. Uh, in social networks, which is very, very valuable because the bottom line isn't to raise money from people. It's actually to change lives and enrich lives. Um, and sometimes that means finding somebody that knows other people that are important. And it's not about the dollar signs. So being able to look at social networking data and be able to get to know somebody because they know five very influential people and we have no way to get to them but we can get to this person at friend raising, another term for it. Uh, but the bottom line, data visualization has been at the heart of this change, and um, it, it's made a massive improvement in terms of the culture of analytics at U of R. So thank you very much. And uh, please remember, yeah, I love that quote. It's a great quote. Thank you.